Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with sports scientist at Train With Push, Matt Cusdub. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 41 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today I have the sports scientist from Train With Push who produced the Push Band. So this is Matt Cusdub and he chats about his background, his experience, and then we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the conversation with regards to velocity-based training, how it can be used in team sports, uh, assessing athlete readiness using, uh, using the Push Band, and then using it in Olympic lifting and some of its derivatives. So it's a really good chat with Matt. I've wanted to get him on uh, for a little while now and, and discuss velocity-based training. I know we've discussed it in a couple of other episodes as well with other various guests, but I wanted to get it from the horse's mouth someone that's working with the technology day to day. So thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate the support over the last couple of months. Had loads of downloads, loads of listens. Um, so again, really appreciate people uh, people tuning in and the great feedback I've been getting. So if you want to follow me on Twitter at Pacey Perform, that's where all the info will go out about new episodes. You can also check out PaceyPerformance.co.uk. All the previous episodes will be on there. You can also subscribe on iTunes and YouTube, um, and you can get all the all the new episodes onto your laptop, uh, tablet, or your phone. Thanks a lot for listening, and I will speak to you after the chat with Matt. Hi guys, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today I have Matt Cusdub coming from Train With Push. So I wanted to get Matt on because there's been so much uh, written um, and spoke about uh, velocity-based training. So I wanted to get someone on that was working um, directly with um with velocity-based training. So just before we get Matt in, I just want to thank him for his time. Um, and Matt, would you give us just a bit of a background uh, and kind of experience, education, um, and uh, welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thanks a lot, Rob, for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm excited to, to be here today. Um, yeah, so a little bit uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'll make this short and sweet. Um, I, I was an athlete growing up. I played a bunch of different sports, but uh, specialized in, in tennis and um, tried to give that a little, little bit of a go um, unsuccessfully. But uh, from there, um, decided to, to go in and, and do a master's in strength and conditioning. So uh, I did do a, a bachelor's in, in kinesiology and then uh, just kind of had a thirst for more knowledge. So decided to to do that um uh, actually did that overseas in the UK um it was a great experience and uh, and then was working with some athletes traveling with uh with a few tennis players um and uh was also doing some research using different devices stuff like that and push was kind of in my hometown in Toronto at the time and uh, I met with the guys and it was just a an incredible um, project and so I I uh, was drawn to it right off the bat and decided to to kind of give it a give it a shot and help them out from sports science perspective and, um, and kind of went from there so uh, that's that's sort of where we are today nice so where did you study in the UK uh, University of, Ed of Edinburgh oh nice yeah. nice city beautiful city beautiful city I was I was busy, so I didn't get a chance to <laughs> do too much exploring, but uh, I had a great experience. Cool. So how did it come about then? Uh, obviously, um, Train With Push is based in, uh, based in your hometown, but how did it come about you working with them? Uh, well, they just, they're a bunch of smart, really smart engineers on the team, uh, designers, uh, developers. Um, and they wanted, they, you know, even the CEO Rami, he had a he had a background in um, 
and robotics and stuff like that. So he, he, and he was a really kind of intense weightlifter, um, but wanted a bit more of kind of the research side of things behind, um, different kind of using different metrics for, for, uh, for feedback in terms of, of training. So, um, we just started off as kind of, uh, as as an advisor and then it kind of progressed from there to, to a full-time role and um that's kind of how it how it started nice so let's get into the meat of it so uh velocity-based training do you want to just give us i mean there's there's obviously going to be some listeners out there who have, who have got a push band who have um kind of more experience than me with regards to velocity-based training but you just want to give us a bit of an overview um and what it is and and how it's developed over the last couple of years yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, it's definitely not something new. Coaches have been using velocity feedback for for years. Uh, even you know the Russians and Bulgarians, they were using uh, different kind of mechanical systems back. Uh, you know, I don't even know how far back, but um, there there are some old texts with different kind of velocity standards for different Olympic lifting movements, and. Uh, it's been used for a while, but the basic premise behind velocity-based training is that uh, you're using um, biometric feedback, so in this case, velocity or, or speed, to uh, to gain more insight into into how someone's performing. So this kind of allows coaches to auto-regulate um, an athlete's uh, training. So right away they can see how fast they're moving either the bar or their body depending on sort of the exercise and from there um it gives pretty good feedback into you know should we decrease the load increase the load um do extra reps sets um and it all kind of depends on uh i mean it depends on many factors what time of year it is what training phase that athlete's in um what components of fitness are they are they working on but it gives that sort of feedback rather than just relying on on a coach's eye which is by no means is is not important it's very important as well but it just gives that extra uh extra insight into what's what's really going on mm -hmm. cool so how long how long has it taken kind of from the from the onset of someone thinking about um, creating the, the push ban to actually it been out there on the market? Mm. So I believe uh, Rami, CEO, had the idea um, about three years ago or maybe over three years ago and uh, kind of started building a team about two and a half years ago or so. So it's uh, it's taken about, it took about two years or so from having a, a small team to to getting out to the market cool so you, you mentioned just then about kind of um assessing readiness of athletes obviously there's so many things that can um can affect how uh, an athlete's feeling during the day you know if it's a, a collegiate athlete exams you know been out the night before how how can how can uh, something like the push band help dictate the intensity and volume of a session yeah, I mean, there's research from a research perspective. It's we're still kind of limited in terms of uh, how we can use velocity for for readiness. But uh, there are coaches that are that have just kind of been using it um, anyway. Develop their own kind of theories behind it, and uh, one way is to well, one of the main ways is to look at jump data. So basically, doing you know, counter movement jumps, squat jumps um, at the beginning of sessions and looking at different metrics. So, for example, you can look at peak velocity and, and track that over time. And once you start collecting enough data, then you can see trends. Okay, this, this athlete is normally in this range and now we're seeing them a bit lower on today. Maybe, maybe they're fatigued. Um, so you can you can look at it that way. Um, I also like to look at uh, you know re reactive strength index. So it's just a 
just jump height over a contact time. So you, you, you step off of a, of, of a box um, and try to be really reactive. And it just gives more insight into how the, the central nervous system is firing. So, uh, if, again, if that's, if that's down, then maybe, like you said, maybe, maybe it's poor sleep or just not enough time between training sessions or uh, just some other lifestyle uh, issues going on with the athlete not handling stress well but it, it just gives you that extra extra bit of feedback um, and then you can that can dictate how that session will play out um, and maybe but even as you're going the beauty about it is that you're no longer um, just monitoring a specific thing from one day to the next but you're monitoring every kind of rep of that set of that session and you can you can like i said auto regulate uh, uh in real time as you're going so um every every session is a testing session mm -hmm. I, I know you mentioned there about uh, using the counter movement jump um, yeah. So, so when when you're looking at that, from I know you said the research is lacking in in certain areas. Um, from a percentage point of view, where would it? At what point would you flag up that something's not right? Would it be a five percent decrease in in counter movement jump? What what kind of percentage are we looking at from your experience? I've seen about ten percent, ten percent drop. Um, there is some variability uh, there as well. So, more than a ten percent drop from one day to the next could would be significant and if you continue to see that dropping it could be uh you know could be red flags but uh you know even even during um let's say you're doing some cleans or something like that and um also i've, I've heard coaches using a 10 percent drop off within a set from the best rep to the worst rep but also across a variety of sets and if you if you normally are doing you know um, you're you're working on power and you're doing eight sets of, of three for example, and uh, you're seeing the drop off occurring a lot sooner in the session, that could be a little bit of a, a sign of of some sort of fatigue setting in. So if you're already seeing a a ten percent drop off within the third or fourth set, then then some concerns may may be there. So, so how would you go about adjusting that? Would you go about adjusting intensity? Would you reduce volume? What would you do there? Yeah. So, again, sort of depends on on the time of year. I mean, if some sometimes it's it's okay to to get that sort of stress on an athlete and just go through that session. Um, and other times, depend. You know, if it's if it's closer to season or in season, then you may want to just cut cut that exercise or cut that session short uh, and then work on, you may have to do some other things, you know, not my expertise, but uh, more on the re recovery, uh, you know, soft tissue sort of work and, and dealing with some stress. But uh, um, yeah, looking at it, like I said, from a, from a session to session basis is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty unique and, and critical. Mm -hmm. So, so how how much data would be would a coach um, be needed to build up before something inferences like that can be can be made? That's a great question, and I think uh, it's something if coaches are listening that they should they should kind of collect a, a fair amount of data first before before starting to use it. Uh, I know there are some coaches that that are just collecting maybe a year or two worth of worth of data uh, before actually um, making any significant changes in, in sort of their programming and their methodologies because uh, they just don't know what it what it means right off the bat um, and if there are any trends um, anything that they can use so I wouldn't suggest uh, necessarily uh, using velocity based training right off the bat, um, but more potentially using your existing uh, methodologies, philosophies in terms of training and looking at the data um, from a kind of a more long term perspective. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I mean, but kind of waiting a year or two is is, is great in theory. But if yeah. you've, if you've got some head of department who's invested, I don't know how many thousands of pounds in some into new technology, whether it's velocity based training or or GPS or anything like that. If, if if you're having to justify your job or justify the, the money that's been spent, realistically, how you know how, how quickly can you um, can you use that data and have at least a certain amount of confidence in it? If 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 not if not perfect, as in waiting a year or two, what you know could you work? Could you use it after two months and and be in the ballpark, or is it kind of you know you'd have to wait that year or two before anything can be can be used? Yeah, so let me just clarify. It, for sure, you can start using it the first day in as a, as a tool to to motivate athletes. Of course, um, because for the most part, if if you're an athlete, you're either working on trying to be uh, faster, uh, have more power, be stronger, or or get bigger. And this day and age, you have to be have to have speed in sports. So. Um, that can be a huge motivational tool for athletes, especially in a team setting, team environment. Um, you know, athletes competing against one another and also competing against yourself from one session to the next. Uh, you know, yesterday or last week, my uh, my velocity was, um, you know, at 0.85 on my back squat. And today, for the same load, I want to beat that. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of, of using it right off the bat. In terms of how it shapes your programming, that may take a, a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah, I mean, like I was saying um, before we started recording, I was having have a little play around with the push band uh, last week when I was in Seattle with a with a friend, and he had the he had the app on his phone, so I couldn't obviously see what was going on until, obviously until after the set. Um, but I didn't want to look an idiot. But I have him see the the velocities first before I actually I rewrap the bar and had a little look. So I can imagine that you know if it, I know we were talking about before that that kind of instant feedback um, would be great as a as a as a feedback tool, which I'm sure is why a lot of people are, are valuing it so highly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean uh, that's something like I said uh, before we started recording uh, that uh, it's. It's something in the pipeline for us, and it uh, it's a big priority for us to get real time feedback uh, into the app as soon as possible. So, just moving on to a um, a situation which I'm sure is is coming up with a lot of coaches. So, using this in a in a team sport setting, so you've got kind of 15, 20 guys. Uh, how how would this be used in that kind of um, busy gym environment? looking at train uh looking at the push band in particular yep so uh, the beauty is that you can have a bunch of athletes with their own device uh they don't have to interchange sort of because of because of its its ease of use and um affordability that you can have many athletes with with a unit um we we have a team system that does allow you to to have multiple kind of tablet solutions across your gym and um they're all interconnected so an athlete could go into any part of a part of the gym and just click on their profile and it would direct them right to their wherever they are in their current session um which makes it pretty pretty easy uh we're also we've been working on a um a a team a, a push compete app which will allow you to see a live leaderboard um you know projected onto any tv in your facility so uh and that can you can set whatever kind of parameters you want maybe you want to look at who's who has the highest power output in a certain exercise or um who's lifting the most load um you know so it's really really breeds competitiveness and uh um, allows coaches to uh, to kind of get their their athletes going, but at the same time, more from a from a training perspective uh, in a team setting, um, if you if you can educate now your athletes as to what 
some of the numbers mean. Like we've seen it a lot with a lot of NCAA and pro pro teams that we work with. Um, you know, they they can now understand uh, when it's time to push, when it's time to to pull back a little bit. Um, what ranges they should be in for different training qualities, and instead of having you know big groups of NCAA teams that are just following templates, um, athletes now are are able to kind of individualize their training uh, in these group settings, which is which is great because, as you know, as a coach you know, that each athlete will adapt at different rates and each athlete can handle different amounts of stress. So, um, that's, that's sort of the beauty of it. Cool. So like you mentioned, it all, it all goes to the app. So if you had, if you had multiple, multiple bands in a, in a team setting, would they have to have a, a separate iPad per band or is it all kind of generated to one, one pad? Yeah, so if with the team system, you can have your entire team uploaded into one app. Um, yeah. Cool. And, and there's, a, there's a facility to be able to, if you kind of um, distance coaching with, with teams or individuals, there's a, there's a facility to kind of send that band off with a, an athlete and everything that they, they perform is generated to the, the coach's iPhone. Is that right? Yeah, uh, we have a, an online software for coaches, so they can program uh, templates, routines, uh, push those out to their athletes, and uh, as soon as the athlete finishes even one set of their routine, it gets synced directly with the online portal, so um, a coach can see basically almost in real time how that athlete's performing from, from anywhere in the world. Nice. And that can be obviously adjust, then adjusted by the coach for the next session and things like that? Exactly. Yeah, cool. everything is uh, really easy, uh, customizable. So, um, And obviously nowadays with so many competitions and a variety of sports, it's, it's really handy to be able to, to, set, to you know, send one of these off with an athlete and uh, still be able to, to do some coaching. Mm -hmm. No hiding. Exactly. That's maybe maybe not so good for the athlete. Yeah. So you spoke a little bit there about kind of thresholds for different different qualities that a coach uh, may want to focus on. Do you just want to talk a little bit about about them qualities and you know which, which velocity um, or what velocities are going to um, be, be focused on kind of strength and speed strength and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, now that obviously there's there still needs to be some research done on on these different ranges, but uh, we have seen that kind of between a 0 0.15 to 0 0.35 meters per second around there. That's sort of your um, your absolute strength. So uh, that's obviously very very slow. Um, if you've ever tried to get down to 0 0.15, it's, it's <laughs> tough. Uh, but uh, I know some power lifters in, in the world that are, their goal is to, to not have a reading at all. <laughs> so they, they know the weight's heavy enough when a device can't register it. So, uh, <laughs> Hard uh, call. Yeah. And uh, so then from there, you can look at uh, maybe kind of like your relative strength or circa max strength that's between 0 0.35, 0 0.45. Um, your kind of accelerative strength, 0 0.45, 0 0.75. Uh, then you get start getting into like your strength speed and your speed strengths, which um, they're about 0 0.75 to to 1.5, and depending on where you are in that kind of force velocity curve, what you're targeting. Um, and then your starting strength is high as over 1.5, and this is all in yeah, this is all mean velocities. Um, a kind of some some other interesting information that or research that's coming out um, it's from a group in Spain. They're looking at kind of velocity loss across uh, a set. So what they'll do is um, if they see that there's 
a big uh, a drop of maybe more than 30, 35% from the first rep to the last rep, they'll consider that to be more of kind of a, a hypertrophy uh, focused set or session. And if it's lower than that, so if it's maybe between 10 and 15%, of a drop, um, and it can be more strength, and then even lower than that could be more your power. So less than ten is kind of your power and speed. Um, so it's yeah. So no, it's uh, it's kind of interesting that you can if you can see those different drops, then you can you know if you're in the right if you're training uh, in the right uh, the right components. So. Do you know the um, so that the, the velocities you mentioned there are the kind of um, the traditional strength exercises? I'm guessing. How does that how does that differ for uh, Olympic lifting? Yeah, so for Olympic lifting, it's uh, it's a little bit different because you're you're probably going to look more at your peak velocities versus your mean velocities. Um, so the numbers will will be higher, and there's really not much in terms of standards. They're a little bit trickier um, because it it really depends on sort of the size of the athlete, how far the bar is moving. Um, that'll greatly affect uh, the velocity. So you may see numbers that are that are much higher. So it it kind of depends. You do have to have a bit more of a coach's eye there and and gain some more data on each individual athlete to know kind of. Okay, for this athlete, we're looking more for for these velocities, and um, and then for another athlete, it could be can, could be completely different, but still the same same component of fitness. Yeah. So how so how much variability is there in the kind of traditional strength exercises, or is that pretty much kind of across the board? Yeah, there's there's less variability. Uh, you can see there's there's really good research. Um, for just a few exercises so far, like uh, back squat, uh, bench press, um, bench pull, where researchers can see, um, they can associate basically a percent one RM with a velocity, and they've they've used you know large uh, populations, so over two hundred um, kind of resistance training subjects. And you can see that uh, there's a really good correlation between uh, velocity and, and percent one RM. So we, we have a we have a better idea. Cool. So how does that differ with an said Olympic lifting? What about the kind of derivatives um, of Olympic lifting? Does that still hold true with so, the kind of the variability? Yeah, there there isn't any research to date on Olympic lifts in terms of that sort of those sort of velocities. Um, it's it's more difficult because as if you're doing a traditional exercise like a let's say a, a back squat, when you get down to uh, the lower velocities, you're still able to to execute the lift um, with a let's say a hang hang clean or hang power clean. Uh, once you even once you start getting into uh, heavier loads, which would which would result in lower velocities. You still need a, a certain amount of speed to execute the lift, so you can't get to, you wouldn't be able to get to a point one five or a point three even on an Olympic lift. It just wouldn't happen. You wouldn't be able to do the lift. Um, so it's uh, it it doesn't follow that same kind of linear uh, regression as a as a as a regular lift. So for for let's say again a back squat, you can really really well predict one RM um, because there is that linear relationship between velocity and and load. As the load gets heavier, velocity uh, um, gets slower. So you can do like a, a series of sub maximal lifts with athletes um, and be able to predict pretty well. Uh, what their uh, what their uh, one RM is, which is going to save coaches a bunch of time and a bunch of effort. Exactly, exactly. It just and 
just the risk of injury with athletes. You, you don't generally want to put them through that. But if you want to give them some good ranges to work work with, and then they have, they don't have to necessarily look at, uh, uh, you know, absolute numbers anymore. When they go into the gym, they have a range. Okay, I'm working on uh, hypertrophy, and that range for for me is between point uh, five and point eight meters per second. And, um, I'm going to load up until I'm in, you know, I'm in that appropriate range. Cool. So, I mean, we were talking before about the fact that it's, it's a wearable. So obviously you put it on your arm rather than, um, some products that are going to come out, which are fixed to the bar. So what's the, the, the pros and cons for for both why, why did you why did you push go down the route of a wearable yeah so for the most part it the versatility with wearables is uh is really high i mean with a push band we can look at a variety of exercises um you know from from barbell exercises to body weight exercises uh dumbbell med ball exercises uh it just gives us the ability to look at a variety of exercises uh, and movements and, you know, even down the road, looking at more sports specific applications. So uh, running and sprinting and rowing and, uh, you know, all sorts of different things that you can, you can gather pretty good data on. Um, and it just, uh, you know, having it in one place, it, uh, it, it allows for, uh, for a lot more ease of use. Um, now you will, there are some drawbacks, obviously, uh, the accuracy may not be as high because we are predicting barbell velocity with, with the device being on the arm. I mean, it's, it's very, very small differences. Um, and we even have, there's peer reviewed research looking at our device versus a motion capture system. And it's, uh, you know, the reliability and validity is there and we, we have other uh, studies in the pipeline now, but uh, when you have something that's directly on the bar, measuring the bar, it's it will be uh, you know have higher accuracy. Mm -hmm. Cool. Plus the um, uh, what's it? What's the what's the difference in cost? I know there's um, a couple of the bar um, bar placed uh, products aren't, aren't available yet. But what would the cost? Will the cost be different for wearables? Um, well, we're we're about 189 US for uh, for a band, and uh, I'm not too sure. I think the others are, are are a bit higher than that, more in the 300. And then obviously your your LPTs, your linear position transducers, they're they're significantly more. Um, but yeah, we're on the lower end end of the spectrum there. Cool. So so where do you see the future of uh, velocity based training and um, push for that matter? That's a great question. Yeah, I think um, we're still we're still in the infancy, so I, I I do think there's a lot of room to uh, to improve on sort of being able to um, help athletes and and even every everyday gym goers assess what they should be doing on on a specific day based on some sort of uh, readiness probably more from an integration standpoint, like being able to integrate data from multiple devices, looking at HRV as well as velocity stuff, um, maybe, maybe even some, some sleep data integrated into that. Um, you know, so there's, there's really good opportunities there that I think uh, we're still just on, just scratching the surface. And, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that'll be very exciting. So, with regards to the push band, obviously the live, um, the live feedback are coming shortly. Yeah, so live feedbacks on the way. That uh, that should be in the app within the next few months or this fall, um, and then some some other things that uh, that we're working on potentially some other metrics. Looking at also looking at um, you know cardio stuff uh we'd like to, to explore that a little bit more and being able to integrate your conditioning as well as your resistance training 
Um, so that's sort of some interesting stuff we're working on uh, moving forward. And, uh, and some other things that are, uh, you know, surprises for now. Cool. Sounds good. Like a surprise. Um, so, so where can uh, listeners get hold of a, a push band? Yeah, so you can go on our site at uh, trainwithpush.com. Um, a lot of information there on, on the product. Uh, blog section kind of helps you through different velocity-based uh, training articles, stuff like that. And uh, even our YouTube channel um, has a lot of videos. Uh, and that's at Train With Push. Uh, it's also the Twitter handle. So uh, yeah, and um, you can always reach out to uh, to myself at Matt at trainwithpush.com if if uh, you have any other questions. Cool. I'll put all uh, all links to that on the site so people can people can jump across there and ask you some questions. That sounds great. Appreciate cool. it, Rob. No worries. Well, I know you've got to jump off to um, jump across to work in ten minutes, so I'll let you go. But just before I let you go, I just want to say thanks for your time. And you uh, took a little bit of a while to get it sorted, um, but we got there in the end. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate it again, Rob, and uh, let's stay in touch. Cool. Let's do that. All right. Thanks, mate. No worries. Speak to you soon. Bye now. Thanks for tuning in to episode 41 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Matt. Don't forget, you can catch up with all previous episodes of the podcast if you subscribe on iTunes and YouTube or shoot over to paceyperformance.co.uk and all the links uh, are on there so you can subscribe uh, and listen via the website. And if you are enjoying listening to the podcast, if you'd be so kind to jump over to iTunes and leave a rating and review, that'd be really appreciated. You can also follow me on Twitter at paceyperform and I'll put out all the links to uh, to the new podcasts each time they go live. So thanks for listening to episode 41 and I will speak to you in episode 42.